Hey y'all, what's up? It is Kelly Marie here. Um, this gonna be a podcast episode. What's up, y'all? I sound a little sick. I'm dealing with like some sinus something. I don't know. It's really crazy. But if you hear me sniffling, that's what's going on. I'm not even gonna edit it out. This is life, okay? <laughs> so today we're talking um from the topic confusion to conviction, confusion to conviction. Um, our verse for today is our chapter for today is Genesis chapter 22, verse one through 19. And this conversation really co- came from, um, I had just been seeing a lot on social media over the last few days of people saying things like, if it's from God, it's not going to be confusing or it'll come with no confusion. And I just kept seeing it. And I'm like, why do I keep seeing this? I don't want to see this anymore. And I literally started like blocking people and like muting pages that were saying things like that. Because that's what I do on social media. Like if somebody posts something that I don't like it, I don't say anything on the comments. I just mute or block the person, you know, depending on who it is. Most of the time it's somebody I don't even know. And it's just coming on my suggested or my for you page. But um, for this, it was like, I kept doing it and it kept coming back. So I was like, okay, this is the Holy Spirit telling me that I need to do a podcast episode on how to know when something is something that is for you, if it's from God, or if it's something that's for you, that's from some other place. Right. Um, and so I'm not sure if like, maybe, I don't know, I'm not gonna hypothesize about why I'm just going to say what I know I'm supposed to be saying right here today. Okay. So we're talking about confusion to conviction and we are in the book of Genesis. So I'm going to read you guys Genesis chapter 22. And this chapter is about Abraham being tested. Now at this point in Genesis, Abraham does have a son. If you've read the book of Genesis previously, you know, it is like messy. Really the whole old Testament is like a soap opera. But yeah, Abraham and Sarah, it's a whole thing. Okay, so you could go read it if you would like to read it. But at this point in the book, Abraham has a son. He only has one son, but he had a desire to have many, many, many sons, many kids. And eventually God did carry that out for Abraham, as we know, Abraham is the father of many nations. Um, But at this point, It was just one one son in the, you know, physical here on the in the earthly realm. So chapter 22 says uh, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. So God called out his name. Here I am, he replied. And then Abraham replied, here I am. Verse two says, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Yo, he just called him to sacrifice his only son. Like, what? We be talking about if God tells you to do something, it's not going to come with any confusion. God just asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son that he prayed for for a very long time. Like, so what? confusion exactly now in the in the bible it does not say that abraham was confused but i guarantee you 2024 a lot of y'all would be confused okay so in verse 3 it says early the next morning abraham got up and loaded his donkey he took with him two of his servants and his son isaac when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering he set out for the place god told him about on the third day Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship him. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Verse six says, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son, Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? (laughs) Y'all at this point, I'm I'm laughing right now because when I first read this, um, first of all, 
I read the Bible over and over and over again, but sometimes things hit me differently. So when I read this in preparation, I was like, oh my gosh, it just hit me. Like this whole time, Isaac had no idea that he was the sacrifice. Like he's just like, wait a second, we got the wood and the fire. What are we sacrificing here? We're sacrificing you, Isaac. Like he had no idea. Um, maybe not funny, but when I realized that I was like, he had no idea. He was, he was being set up. Uh, so in verse eight, it says, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the land for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Abraham slick lied to him, but Whatever. Verse nine, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He replied. Verse 12 says, do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld him from me, your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Verse 14 says, so Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And verse 19 says, then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. All right. What also hit me as I read this, um, when I was in this study was that the servants have no idea what just happened. Like (laughs) they was just alone for the ride, preparing, helping. They didn't see anything with Isaac being sacrificed they were not told anything they were just there literally to fulfill their job and that was it (laughs) so there's probably some message there like in there somewhere about like you can take people with you like of course not everybody's meant to go with you but you can take people with you and still not give them all of what God gave you because they just might not understand it because it wasn't given to them. Right. But you can give them enough, right. You can give them enough for them to trust you as their leader or to lead them somewhere or to have the assistance that you need to carry out the plan. But I promise you 2024, like I just know in this day and age, if you would have told the servants, I'm going to go sacrifice my son, they would not have helped they would not have gone along with it. They would have tried to talk him out of what God told him to do. And listen, I don't know about y'all, but I'm not trying to be around nobody who's trying to talk me out of what God told me to do. Like, cause I don't got time to be fighting the devil and fighting you. I just don't have time for it. It's too much. So let's get into, um, my notes. Okay. I want to, I want to stop for a second. Cause this entire thing is about Abraham being tested. And when I read it, I thought to myself, how was I, when I was tested, not tested in life, right. But just in general with tests. And the first thing that came to my mind was like scantrons. Y'all remember we used to have, do they still use scantrons? I don't even know. But when they used to have scantrons, it was like, so easy to take a test like people knew when they walked in the classroom oh this is getting trying test I'm cheating now listen I'm not a cheater I didn't cheat because I'm too nervous for that like if I lie I literally start to giggle so I just don't lie because my tails I like I do not have a poker face I literally will be in stitches rolling around on the floor laughing that's just my personality but 
I know that people knew like, oh, it's a Scantron test. I can cheat because it's very easy to like see the answers because it's just A, B, C, D. Like you don't even really have to be like looking, looking at somebody's paper. You can look at your peripheral vision and cheat on a Scantron test. And people used to be so excited. But here's the thing with Scantrons, and I'm an overthinker as well, so I always thought about this. Like, what if the person you're cheating off of is also not confident in their answers? But you don't know that because you're not having a conversation with them. You're just cheating off of them, assuming that they know the answers. Meanwhile, they may be second guessing themselves, selecting the wrong thing, and now you select the wrong thing. So, like, the, just the entire idea of cheating to me did not make any sense, aside from me giggling. Um, but the lesson being right, like you have to just read and study for yourself, because if you try to look at somebody else's scantron, you still may be selecting the wrong answers because what it looks like on the outside, what that person looks like on the outside of what their life looks like and what their morals look like and what their relationship with God looks like from us on the outside does not mean that that's what it is on the inside. And when I used to be sitting down taking those tests, just like me, myself, and I, I always used to say to myself, like, I wish I would have studied a little bit more. Like, I wish I would have spent a little bit more time in my textbook so that I could feel more confident about my answers. Because the thing about taking a test is that it's not just, is this the right answer? Is this the wrong answer? Like, there's also a mindset piece that plays into it of you doubting your answers and then going backwards to check your answers and overthinking that. And so in order for you to take a test and to take a test confidently, you really have to have studied like a lot, right? Like almost overstudy. And when I would sit down and take the test, I would also I'll also be thinking like, I wish this was open book. Like, you know, some teachers used to, used to just give open book tests. Like, I'm just giving y'all open book tests because y'all ain't gonna read the textbook no way. And there's no way you're gonna be able to find what you need to find in this little short amount of time. So they would give us open book texts, open book tests. Um, but when I was taking a test that was not open book, I valued my book more in that moment when I was being tested more than I ever did when I was not being tested and I could have just picked up my textbook if my test was on Thursday you couldn't beg me you couldn't pay me to pick up my textbook on Tuesday two days before the test but on Thursday you couldn't get that book out of my hands you could not pry the book out of my hands on the day of the test because I knew I was going to be tested Here's the thing, y'all. This is an open book test. Life is an open book test. The Bible is your book. Don't be the person who gets caught in the middle of a test wishing they could open their textbook. Now, to God be the glory, even in the middle of a test, you can open your Bible because he just knew that we were just the hot mess child that wasn't going to study. I think he knew that about us. OK, so you can always open it, always open your book. But just don't be that person like you just know. Don't cheat. That's not going to work for you. Didn't work then is not going to work now. But this is an open book test. And so in Genesis chapter 22, we see Abraham being tested. He didn't even second guess. There's nothing in the text and I'm reading directly from it. I could hypothesize maybe he was confused because like who wouldn't be confused in that situation? I can hypothesize that maybe somewhere in between these steps of hearing God say, sacrifice your son, him packing up his, you know, all the stuff he needed to make that happen, traveling three days with two servants and his son on donkeys. I could hypothesize that somewhere in there he hesitated. But guess what? I'm not going to do that because that's not what the word says. OK, nowhere in chapter 22 during this event that we just read about, does it say that Abraham hesitated nowhere? God gave him what seemed to be an out of the blue 
insane, no explanation for, no reasoning, no underlying circumstances. The math was not math in the sense, was not making sense. None of that. And he did not question it. I wish I had a faith like Abraham. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. And I made a couple of, of observations that I want to share with you. Uh, the first one is tests are meant to deepen your capacity to obey God. Because even what I just said, I wish I had a faith like Abraham, Abraham's capacity to obey is deeper than my capacity to obey right now in the current moment. If God told me to do that, I don't know if I'd be able to do that. I would, I would love to say it, but let's be real, right? My capacity to obey is not as deep as Abraham's capacity to obey was at that moment. I pray that one day my capacity is that deep to obey. But when I'm saying that, I almost hesitated a little bit because when you start praying for an increased capacity, God's going to give you an opportunity to test and passing the tests, plural, is the only way to deepen your capacity to obey. Because I may ask you for a little bit today, but he's going to ask you for a little bit more next time and a little bit more, more, more next time. That allows you to deepen your capacity. If the sacrifice stayed the same every single time you had to sacrifice, you'd get used to the sacrifice and you wouldn't actually be going any deeper. You'd be on the same level. Tests are meant to deepen your capacity to obey. My second observation God called him to sacrifice something that he loved dearly and only had one of. God called Abraham to sacrifice something that he loved dearly and only had one of. He only had one son. Like, it wasn't like he said, sacrifice a donkey and Abraham got five donkeys. Like, no, that would have been too easy, right? He called him to sacrifice something that he loved dearly. Okay. And my last observation I'm going to share with y'all is God didn't step in till the last minute, y'all, the very last minute. Do y'all realize that we read that? It was like he had already, his son was already strapped to the wood and the fire was about to be set. Like he had the knife above his head about to make the sacrifice and then God called to him. Then that's like the very last minute. Like, it's not like I'm going to test you. That's a real test. It's not like, oh, I'm just playing. Like when they got to the location, I'm just playing. I'm sacrificing. Like, no, he was really about to do it. And so it was a true, it was a true, true test. So I want to give you three things that you are looking for when you are trying to determine if something is from God, whether that means someone is giving you an opportunity and you want to know if that opportunity is from God, whether or not someone has entered your life and you want to know if that someone is from God, uh, uh, whether or not you are wondering if, um, God is asking you or telling you to do something right. How to know if something's from God, three things. Number one, You're going to be called outside of your comfort zone. If it's from God, it's most likely it's going to call you outside of your comfort zone. All throughout the Bible, we see it here in the story uh, of in the book of Genesis with Abraham. But all throughout the Bible, what you will notice is that when God is, is when something is from God, right? If it's a call from God, if it's a person from God, it comes from outside of the comfort zone because that is his way to let you know that there is no humanly way this could have been orchestrated. Like that's his way to say, this is me because there's no other way that it could have been someone else. So literally when we say the phrase, make it make sense, If it's from God, there's no way for us to make it make sense because he works in a different realm and he works in a different way that we don't have explanation for. So if he wants us to know, hey, this is from me, not from somebody else that you know that lives here on earth with you. I'm going to make it so outside of the comfort zone that it's not even going to make sense. 
Oh, I get it. That's from God. Okay. So if you're called outside of the comfort zone, it's from God. That's why I always tell people like, uh, when people are like, like, I have conversation with my friends all the time. And if I have a conversation with my friend and she's like, well, I don't know about this guy, this new guy. He's cool, but he's not my type. It's outside the comfort zone. Look a little bit deeper. (laughs) Okay. Look a little bit deeper. Um, And of course that applies to more than just men. But if you have a type and you have a list, I am encouraging you right now to look outside your comfort zone. Number two, the second way you know it's from God. If a sacrifice is required. Okay. Now, um, you will feel a struggle most of the time, right? And normally this is something that if it's something that we treat as an idol or we treat it as close to an idol, um, then God will call us to sacrifice it. Something that you have almost put in competition with him, he will call you to sacrifice that thing in this scenario. It was Abraham's only son, not saying that Abraham loved his son more than God, but he loved his son a lot. And when you love something a lot or you love someone a lot and that amount of love gets close to the amount of love that you have for God, he will call you to sacrifice. Okay, I'm not saying that it's not going to come back. That's God's plan, you know, whatever his plan is. But he's going to call you to sacrifice it because he does not take kindly to idols. Okay, so whether that means money, you started to love money more than you love your relationship with God. And that sounds like real cray cray. Like who would do that? Like, no, but sometimes y'all be getting on Zoom calls before you did your Bible study with clients. Like, why are you on a Zoom call with a client? and You haven't opened up the Bible today. Your love of money or your apparent need to make money is now more important than your Bible study time. Like it's more important than God. And when I say apparent need, I mean, apparent as in you think that you need to get on a zoom call before you open your Bible, because you think that you need the money or else you're not going to be able to live. No, you need God or you're not going to be able to live. If you don't wake up 30 minutes earlier and do a 30 minute Bible study and stop making up excuses of why you got to get on a client zoom call at 8am and you haven't opened up your Bible yet, girl, get it together. Like, come on now, get it together. You have to give up to go up, right? So normally he'll call us to sacrifice something that we treat as an idol or treat close to an idol. Um, That sacrifice usually, and sacrifice in general, it usually results in you leaning more into your relationship with God. And that is what is needed sometimes in order for us to survive certain situations. So what you'll notice is... You'll receive something from God, whether it's an an assignment, a person, whatever, some type of message, some type of vision. You'll receive something from God. And then shortly after, you'll go through some spiritual warfare or you'll go through a battle. That is because the sacrifice prepares you for what's coming next. Testing and sacrifice is a way to sharpen you. It's a way to mold you. It's a way to increase your character and prepare you. And once you're prepared, then you're able to handle something that is a little bit bigger or something that is a little bit tougher, which is why you also tend to go through spiritual warfare or battles after you've been tested or after you've been called to sacrifice or given something that is from God. Okay, does that make sense? Sacrificing is going to make you feel like pruned. Sometimes we see it as a pruning season where it's like all these things are being taken away from me. Like I'm losing friends. I've lost a job. I lost, you know, a a relationship. I lost, you know, money. I lost a client. I lost a business, whatever it is, right? We see it as a pruning season. Things are falling off. The sacrificing, and here's the difference between sacrifice and a pruning. A pruning is God's taking it away. A sacrificing is your taking it away. Like God can call you to sacrifice, but he's not going to make you sacrifice. If he is going to remove it, it's going to be a prune. 
Okay. It's going to be a prune if he's going to remove it. The sacrifice is you is, is when he gives you the opportunity to remove it. When you do not obey the sacrifice, you go through the pruning. When you do not obey the sacrifice, if you do, if you get it from God, you do not obey the call to sacrifice, you will go through a pruning season. So if you're going through a pruning season right now, that's because God already told you to remove that thing or remove that person from your life or, or leave that job or let that business go or take a pause on this project over here and you didn't listen and now you're going through a pruning season and things are being stripped away and it feels like you're being punished but it's really that he's developing you and preparing you for what's coming next. Because if you want to survive that thing, you're going to have to lean into your relationship with God. And if you don't voluntarily lean into your relationship with God in order for you to survive, he's going to make you lean in because he needs you longer than what you would be here. If you didn't have him, he needs you longer. He needs you more. Your life's not over yet. It feels like it because everything's being stripped away. It feels like, man, I don't want to be here no more. Like, I don't have nothing. I've lost everything. He is drawing you in closer so that you can survive the next season because the calling that he's put on your life is going to require you to be here a bit longer. So hang in there. Like literally hem of the garment, like just grab the hem of the garment and hang in there because the pruning is going to stop. And when the pruning ends, when you weather the storm and the pruning ends and you come out on the other side, you're going to bloom to a whole new level because a flower that has had the weeds cut a plant that has had the dead leaves pulled off of it, a plant that has, has experienced a cutting back, blooms a lot fuller than one that has not. It's a requirement of growth. And it's not something that you can avoid. It happens to all plants. If you, if you grow plants, you know what I'm talking about right now. Sometimes leaves die. Sometimes branches just die. They got to be cut off. Sometimes they break off, but they got to be cut off. Okay. And if they're not cut off, this, this right here blew my mind when I realized this. If they're not cut off, they will break off in certain seasons. So like trees that are just in the forest, you'd be like, but trees in the forest just grow. Like no one's out in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, like cutting the dead leaves off the, you know, trees. How are they continuing to grow in certain seasons, like winter and those colder months like that, the dead will just break off because of the season and the temperament and the environment. Sometimes it's just, it's just going to break off because the season you're in, but sometimes it's going to be a cutting and you may feel that cutting. Okay. So it's a sacrifice. That's the second thing. The third way that you know that it's from God, God's going to tell you. Y'all probably was like, what else is she going to say? Cause she's snatching my edges right now. I hope I'm snatching your edges. Um, cause that means this is impactful. God's going to tell you like he will tell you God called Abraham by name. It wasn't a sneaky thing. Like he talks to you. He said, Abraham, that was literally the first word of that chapter. It was Abraham. And it doesn't just say Abraham. Like if you go read your Bible, I think I'm in the, what am I in right now? I'm in the NIV, but it literally says he said to him, Abraham, there's an exclamation mark there. Like, and then he waited for God, waited for Abraham to reply. God will call you by name, but your ability to hear his voice, your ability to identify that this is his voice 
depends on how often you meditate on the word. He calls you by name, but if you don't know what his voice sounds like, you're not going to answer. It's like when you're in a crowd and if you have like a, if you have like a, a general name, you know what I'm talking about right now. My name is Kelly. Like everybody in a mama's name is Kelly. So if I'm out in a crowd and someone says, Kelly, I'm not going to turn around because I'm going to assume that whoever is saying Kelly doesn't know me because I don't know that person's voice. God could very well be calling your name right now and you are not responding because you don't know his voice. And it's a very, it's very, it feels sad for me to say like, you don't know his voice. Like, how do you not know his voice? But if you don't meditate on the word day and night, you don't know his voice. Like you don't know what he sounds like because you don't have any references for what his voice sounds like. Like I have references for like when people tell me things, I'm like, girl, that was God. And I just be wondering, like, how does she not know that was God? Oh, because she doesn't meditate on the word day and night. So she doesn't know. But if she knew that's happened before, God has done that before. He said that before he called out to that person in that same way. He gave that assignment to someone before in the Bible. That's how I know. That's how I'm able to recognize because I know what it sounds, what his voice sounds like. And I know what to look for. But if you don't meditate, you won't know what to look for. Abraham also knew it was God's voice because he had been communicating frequently with God. And he knew the consequences of disobedience. He knew he was like, nah, he didn't ask me to do some stuff before and I didn't do it. And it was a hot mess. So now that he's calling me by name and I recognize his voice and he's asking me to do something, I know how to respond now. I'm going to try something different. Let's just go with 110% obedience, zero questioning, and we're going to do this thing. I'm going to tell the least amount of people as possible (laughs) as I'm carrying this out. But he knew, right? He was sure it was him. He didn't question. He was, Abraham was sure it was God. He communicates frequently. I suggest you do the same. All right. So those are the three ways that you know it is from God. I encourage you to go read Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 through 19. It's a very easy read. I feel like all of Genesis is a very easy read, but uh, you should definitely go read it. Thank y'all for listening to this episode. Let me know if you want me to cover any other topics. I love y'all. Thank you for listening. See you next time.